Good afternoon to Safari Live. We have just started a little bit later because of some streaming issues that we had, but we're excited to finally have your Archer with us. This afternoon you'll have Samuel Chevalier as your presenter, driving you through this bush, and you'll have Dave behind the camera, who will be getting those, those lovely pictures, or rather video, of the fascinating animals that we might find this afternoon. And we are looking to see if we can find a male lion, so Brent was with a male lion this morning that was walking around this area. This is Gwari Pan, close to Bufalzuk Dam. That's where we are. And so we've just made it to this location where they were kind of, kind of seen earlier, but they could have easily moved. So it was just one male. There was also a mating pair that was in the area, which is a little bit more north and a little bit more east. So there was two pairs mating and one that was moving around this area. So. We're just going to move slightly, bumble around here, see if we can find any last tracks of those lines. Potentially, we might just find one of them lying up next to the road. Let's just see what happens and drive along. It's good to be finally back on the road. Been missing drive for quite some time, a whole day. When you're not on drive for a day, you kind of just miss and you just don't know what's going on. So it's very exciting to, to be back on the road. And I'm, I always get excited going out with Dave because we're both very new here and we both enjoy exploring and see what, what we might find for the first time. So these are the Birmingham boys that we're tr currently trying to look for. And we were told that they were on this road, but it's already been about six, seven hours since they were last seen. The day is pretty much past, so they could very well have moved. And especially with mating pairs, it's it can change the dynamics of things and they might move during the day so it's not like they're as static as they normally are when you find lions during the day. Lions will sleep up to 21 hours or they will sleep the whole day. They're only really active for the last three hours of the day or when they've got cubs and they're playing and that sort of thing. So you normally only find active lions at night time. But you just never know with, with mating pairs. They are actively trying to mate with one each other one another so I'll just be looking every now and then to the left and the right thank you it's very I just got a note saying welcome back Sam I hope you're feeling better um, thanks everyone um yeah it wasn't nice to to leave the show yesterday morning um, because yeah basically my ear just progressively got worse so I'm feeling better not 100 percent but at least 90 to 95 and it was better for me to come out today and see how it was and it's doing great um, basically what, what i think happened was with the pressure change it went from very very warm kind of conditions to very very cold conditions there's a little squirrel over here jumping oh let's see if you can see that squirrel you might just put there he goes you can see the shit there he is on the it's a little squirrel to start out drive off so they move very, very quick on those trees and they're diurnal animals, so the only real time you're going to see a squirrel is during the day. I think he's moved off now. I can't see him anymore. But that was a nice little way to start the day with a squirrel. Very positive. <laughs> Always enjoy seeing a squirrel. Echo would like to know where could you send your questions to? You can send it via YouTube if you want to Echo, or you can email us, email at questions at wildearth.tv or Twitter, you can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and those are the three medium or forms of medium that we use to collect some data. So please let us know if you have any questions for this afternoon. It's, I think it is 21 degrees Celsius and 77 Fahrenheit, so that's the temperature that we... Can you smell that Dave? Basically, I can smell lion poo. It's very, very pungent. I hope it's not on my tire, because then we'll, we'll be following us for quite some time. Okay, let's carry on. Let's see if we can locate these, one of these male lions.
was told, we were told that they were on this road. So, as I said, they could have easily moved. But we're just going to have a look around. I haven't seen the Birmingham boys for quite some time, or quite some time rather, and um, I'm quite excited to see what they're looking like, if they look well fed. So we're going to actively look to see if we can find anything here, around here today. And in the meantime, let's go and see how Brent's doing, wherever he is on the reserve. On the Sunset Safari, my name is Brent Yosemith. I have Jean Dre on camera, and uh, as a special treat, we actually have Hubert from the security detail out with us, and he's going to be m working as a mobile tracker. So, if we find any tracks, we're going to put Hubert on them. So, we got a report from the technical department while they were fixing or fiddling with something at the Cheetah Plains antenna that there was a leopard lying on the termite mound right next to it. Now, I'm not sure who, uh, so we're going to go down, see if we can find that leopard's tracks and hopefully find the leopard. And I'm secretly hoping it's Shavambalan, who's a male leopard I've never seen before. One of Karuna's offspring. So we're getting quite close now, very exciting. And uh, uh, don't forget to ask us questions. You can do that by popping an email to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. But it is a beautiful winter's late afternoon. It is not warm by any means. It's 21 degrees Celsius, 70 Fahrenheit, and uh, pretty chilly for this time of the day. Normally, we're used to sitting a couple of degrees warmer, but as a positive note, we could see some early movement from the big cats. Safari Dean's wondering if I, ever in my life I've experienced a dry wet season and a wet dry season. Uh, not so much. You do occasionally get rain in the dry season, but not, I wouldn't say, a wet dry season. You have certain months or certain years that will be slightly more wet, but nothing uh, that normally coincides with a wet, wet season and a wet dry season. Uh, but if you have a dry, dry season, it's pretty certain you're going to have a very dry Sorry, if you have a dry wet season, you're going to have a very dry, dry season. But hopefully it will lead us to lots of kitty cats because it does make tracking a little bit easier. And also all the prey species are slightly easier to catch. We're now on the Cheetah Plains driveway, so we're about to drop through into Cheetah Plains. And uh, the last place that leopard was seen was to the east of us. But going out onto the plains could also mean cheetah. Uh, the last wild dog tracks I saw were also here, and there's always a chance of the Styx lionesses sneaking in to the western sectors around Juma Dam. Don't get confused, not the Juma Dam Cam. Uh, that's Vuyatela Dam in front of the Juma Lodge, and there's a dam on Cheetah Plains called Juma Dam, just to make things a little bit complicated. So we are starting to check carefully, because it has been so cool today, there is a possibility that leopard might have moved more than we expect, or than it would have normally on a, on a, on a hot day. So it always pays to be vigilant and check for tracks. Through a little dip here, and uh, we might get a bit of signal breakup. So, before that happens, let's jump back on board with Sam. So, Brent is off to the plains to see what he might be able to find this afternoon. Dave and I are still smelling lion dung and we're just trying to work out if he could be here anyway. We're just looking into these thickets. Sometimes it's not that not that easy to see them as their mane will just be covered in the shade because they often lie in the shade during the day. So we're just looking closely around here. There was fresh tracks. And there is very, very fresh smelling dung. I wish you could smell it with me. It's quite a pungent smell. I think we always use that word pungent. It's 
it's really, really disgusting, actually. That's the best word. That's the best word to actually explain lion, lion poo. And when you get it, when you drive over it in your car, it gets stuck to your wheel, and you will be smelling that for the whole drive. So I don't think I've done that, but I, I could have. Child Moth, good afternoon. You would like to know what is my favorite animal that I've ever seen? Well, the, my most favorite animal I've ever seen is probably the jaguar. Uh, probably, yeah. Uh, because it was, you know, Child Moth, it was, it was such an adventure. You know, I went into a country where I never spoke my language and I tracked on land that I'd never walked. And it was all just very new, very exciting. and. The jaguar in the Pantanal and in that area is kind of the most, well, in terms of the ecological intelligence, what it, the influence that the jaguar has on that area is really quite large. And so when you see one, I don't know, it was just the most, it was the most incredible thing to experience. It was really, really incredible. So I can't see this lion. A child moth, what is the most incredible animal you've seen? I'd like to know what you think and enjoy it also very depends on what what motivates you what intrigues you the most like sometimes a moth or a butterfly will intrigue my my interest in some of the natural world okay so we're just going to turn around here because i think we might have missed that line i'm pretty sure i smelt and saw some fresh tracks down this road so let's go and have a look Raisa would like to know why are there so many moths and why are they not well, why are they why are they so beautiful so why so few moths and why so beautiful well Raisa like to be honest with the natural world most things are beautiful because they're trying to adapt to a, a situation or or to to their to their environment so you have a posematic coloration which will the flashy colors that try and stop other predators from coming to it like red and orange is quite a dangerous kind of color out here in the bush so some some of these butterflies have that to scare off insects or animals that will try and eat it but also they will adapt kind of the eyes like try and get the eyes of, of scarier looking predators onto their their wings to try and show other predators that they are scary and in that kind of adaption they create these beautiful colors as well as uh, patterns on their wings and I mean, that, that's probably the best answer, but of course, the moths are nocturnal, so it's preventing them also to getting eaten from nocturnal animals. So it will be very, very different to a butterfly, for example, that we see quite a lot of during the day. I know Brent loves his butterflies, so he'll really, really be able to go into depth with all the different types of butterflies that we get here. I also love my butterflies, I'm very new to it, I'm learning a little bit more and more every day. As I am tracking, tracking is, that's probably my most favorite thing to do out here in the bushes, to, to learn and investigate an environment, to understand things as, as what, they, what they could be because of the relationship of all the organisms in this ecosystem. For example, like the other day when I saw a jackal, we saw a jackal, we saw a honey badger in the same day. And I was then reading up and f I found out that it, you'll often find jackals and honey badgers together because sometimes the, the honey badger is feeding on something and then the jackal kind of to is tolerated by the honey badger because it sits around in the background and sometimes the honey badger doesn't eat everything that it might claw out of the ground. So in the activity of one animal, we might find an array of other animals that be will be lurking around it, such as a number of birds that will be behind the elephant as, as it walks. So it's all quite fascinating, really. I'm just going to get a quick update from Brent around where the last position was of this, of this line. Brent, Leo Smith, do you copy Brent? Friends, please can you go again with that last position of that lion on Waripan? 
Copy, I did drive those tracks. Um, it doesn't seem to be anything there, but I'll go again just to make sure. All right, so we just got an update from Brent um, around where these lines might be. So we drove off-road a little bit earlier where he saw them, but they weren't anywhere to be seen. But we're gonna go again, just in case, you know, because lines, as I said, they won't, most, most often they won't move during the day. They'll, they'll look after their energy by lying up in the shade. And so the chances of them having left is quite small, but because, as I said, there was mating pairs earlier, they could very well have left. So I'm, I'm starting to hear a few things. Susan in Florida has asked a very, very good question around because a lion is a carnivore and eats a lot of meat, do you think that it influences the kind of sleeping habits of lions? That's a very, very good question, Susan. It's interesting. I think, I do think that that is an influence. I, I think that they, they have the ability to rest more um, than, than what elephants or, so, or other animals do because they have to eat a lot in order to to, to get the energy that they need. When, they, when, you, when you're eating meat, I think you can get a lot more energy than, than what herbivores do. So that gives the opportunity for other animals to, to conserve the energy. And proteins also, in that, in that answer, also proteins are a lot more difficult to break down than some of the other substances. So it could also be that, that they need that rest in order to break down all that protein that they're eating. It's a, it's a really good question. Thanks for that, Susan. So, Dave, if you see any tracks heading off into the east here, see if you can see them. Because basically where they were last seen, so they were last seen on this road halfway to Drakensberg, which is the road that we're going towards now. And it's always worthwhile just going for another check to see if something might have crossed. Also going to look out for any tracks of those lines. So they have the, the largest tracks in lines. Oh, did, did you see that jump across screen there? That was a common dacre. So that literally jumped, and that's—I mean—that's sometimes the only times you're ever going to see a common dacre is when they run into screen. So that's very cool. Having a common dacre jump past us. So we're going to carry on and see if we can locate on this male line. Brent has just arrived on the plane, so let's go and see how he's doing. We'll see just now. So we've arrived and we're really close to three in a row pan. And the antenna's not far from here, so we're just checking really carefully for any sign of tracks maybe coming out of this block. I'm just going to go very slowly. We have found quarantine sleeping in that marula tree right there but i am really hoping it's not quarantine i'm hoping it's shavambalan which will be a new leopard for me i know some of our old well not old and correct our long time viewers uh, saw him when he was just a cub Vicky says Shivambalan is Shangan for emerald spotted wood dove because he was quite shy when he was a youngster. Thanks for that, Vicky. I did not know that. Just trying to see if it, if it is quarantine, whether he's on one of his favorite branches that I found him on before. But it doesn't look like it. 
although it's unlikely to find a leopard in a tree, all young males can always be a bit, a bit, bit different because while it's cool, I mean, it's really cold. It's only 70 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment. So the possibility of him, a leopard lying up where it's a bit cooler and in the wind without a kill being there is unlikely. But young male leopards tend to do silly things, so you never know. So, so far, so good. No tracks heading across. I think what might have happened is the tech team might have disturbed him while they were working and he maybe just moved a little bit further away from the termite mound he was on to have a snooze without being uh, having to listen to tech drills and hammers and whatever the tech department does when they go out here to the antennas. check this little road junction here carefully so Hoover who's in the USA would like to know which of the predators produces the quickest kill now that is a near impossible question to answer it completely depends on the situation. Uh, for example, a lion and a baby impala will be instantaneous, but a lion and a giraffe or a buffalo will take half an hour, 40 minutes sometimes. The same goes with a leopard. So a lot of it depends on the prey. So there's no real winner there. Uh, possibly wild dog, because they dismember their prey so quickly. But uh, it is, it is, it's a very difficult question to answer with no real one correct answer it all just depends on the independent situation A huge safari live welcome to Alessandro who's a new viewer from Brazil so Brazil have their own spotted cats in the Jaguars Alessandro we're looking for a leopard our spotted cat of Africa or one of the two but Alessandro would like to know where we are at this very moment we are in the Sabi Sands game reserve and we'll start on the bigger scale and and work our way down we're in uh, South Africa in a province called Mpumalanga, which means where the sun rises. So we're in the northeast of South Africa, uh, inside the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Reserve, which is a, a, a 13 million acre area of unfenced wilderness for the animals. And if we go a bit smaller, we're then in the Greater Kruger National Park, which is all in South Africa. The Transfrontier Reserve goes across multiple countries. We go a bit smaller, we're in the Sabi Sands, which is about 120,000 acres, and we're in the northern sections, or the northeastern sections right now, on a property called Cheetah Plains Private Game Reserve, and we're in search of a leopard. I hope that helps Alessandro, and welcome to Safari Life. Just see the antenna through there. Now I'm sort of in two minds. Do we drive all the way around the block or do we go to exactly where the last tracks were? Hmm. Hmm. Let me think about it for a little bit while we drive on. Uh, Deborah in uh, Ohio is wondering if I've ever had a close encounter with the Big Five. Uh, fortunately, I'm very lucky. I've had lots of close encounters with the Big Five, but I think Deborah's meaning uh, dangerous encounters rather than close encounters. Um, uh, the, probably the worst one I've had. I've had two. One with a hippo as well. Um, but Deborah, one that has caused me some injury is I, um, I had a little accident with an elephant in the Central African rainforests uh, in Gabon. 
uh, dislocated my hip, but uh, and left me with a, a slight injury there, which should be fixed in about a month or so. So that's probably the most dangerous encounter I've had. We will tell. I will tell the story a bit later. At the moment, I. Really So I've decided to go look at the last tracks quickly. So this is the little two track that leads into the Cheetah Plains antenna where our tech department came across a leopard this morning. We saw no sign of that leopard crossing too further to the west. So I'm hoping it's still in this block. said it was sitting on a termite mound. I think it was the second termite mound rather than the first one. There we go, you can see the antenna stretching through that I'm just going to go to that termite mound quickly and uh, have a quick look. I might have to do a little bit of a walk to see exactly where the tracks go. But it looks like, oh, I'm pretty sure the leopard moved off because of the tech team. And they said it was sitting on top of this monster termite mound here and then headed off sort of in a westerly direction. Now let's just make sure it's not hiding just beyond and came to inspect, which is not uncommon. Once tech, the tech department left, the leopard came to see what they were up to, but it doesn't look like it. So there we go, there's the termite mound and no leopard on top. So let's go see what Sam's got. He says he has a mystery track. So we've just been looking for that lion track and I've just followed this game path as you can see it's quite clearly a game path here as it goes up along here and I came down we started over here so there's tracks that's going all the way up but I'll, av I'll be able to show you one of the tracks in the sand here so have a look at that track in the ground there so that's a male lion track there that's just headed off in that direction I think is it this one we're looking at yep so that's the male lion track that's heading off in that direction. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk it. I'm going to walk and see if I can find it in a few seconds. But I think what would, what would be also useful is we drove it quickly just to see potentially if there was something there. So let's just drive it very, very quickly. See if there's any lines on the side of the road or a line on the side of the road. It's only one set of tracks there. So this is exciting. We're getting closer and closer to that of the line. And it goes off into that thicket there. So let's be very, very quiet as we move across here. See if we can find this line. So it's headed off in that direction. So we went up there. It could potentially be in those bushes. So have a look with us to see if you might be able to spot that mane of that line. The game path is still right next to the road here can't see that big big man yet of course i've only just got back in the vehicle so let's stay together and see if we can find it no lion at the moment i can't see it but it could very well be lying underneath 
some cover in the distant trip. So there's lots and lots of trees on the road as well because there's been quite a few elephants in the area. I can't see if there's any lions down there at the moment. But what will give it away is that big man just sitting up potentially as the vehicle drives past. So I'm just looking through that thicket there. That game, that path that we were just looking at, if you look at this termite mound over here, just behind it there, you'll see there's a path that is kind of walking there. You'll just see it um, with that small little plant that's just over there. And that's where that game path is. So those game paths will often be driven by the same, well, not driven, sorry, walked by the same animal every single night. And that's where it does its scent marking. That's what makes it easier to track out here in the bushes because you get used to the kind of paths that the animals walk during the night. And so it's still going up along here. Can't see him the time being. Vicky, wow, your most m memorable moments is watching those humpbacks. Wow, that must have been just the most incredible, incredible experience to have, to have seen. Vicky, I actually saw hump, uh, a humpback the other day that was getting killed by orca. Yeah, that's not something you see, hear or see every day. But what you saw is a group of them, which is very, very cool, Vicky. I saw a, a baby humpback that was getting killed by an orca outside Cape Town. It was quite, a, quite an experience to have seen. So it looks like that male line is off, off into the thicket there. So we're just going to follow the road and if we're lucky we'll get to see that line. At some point I might get out my vehicle a bit later to see if I can walk and find that line sit up in the distance there. So it's quite difficult because this road takes you on all sorts of different directions. Have a look at this termite mound. This is actually a very, very well looked after termite mound. As you can see that there's two differences between the soil type of that termite mound. And you'll see on the right, that soil is a lot more darker, a lot more thicker than the one on the left. And that means that it is active. So that's an active termite mound over there. And also the reason why I want to show you the termite mound is because animals like to lie up on these termite mounds because they also provide warmth. They pro provide warmth for different animals that like to sit on it. But it also creates a vantage point where an animal like a cheetah or a leopard would lie up and look into the distance to see is there anything that might be lurking around here. And we know that we saw a common daker moving around. So there are a couple animals that are around. And what was exciting we, we went, we went past Buffalo Circuit a little bit earlier and we saw, we saw a, um, we saw a baby hippo. That's what we saw. We saw a baby hippo a little bit earlier by Buffalo Circuit Dam, which is something I really, really want to show you. Hopefully that, that baby will still be there. I'm pretty sure she will be, or he will be. So we'll drive this road towards Buffalo Circuit Dam and then we'll come back around to see if we can find tracks of that lion. So we'll see a baby hippo and hopefully a lion this afternoon. That male lion seems to be quite thick into the bushes there. So it's not making it very easy for us to see. So all you would see is just this mane lying up in the shade somewhere. But you know what will give it away? What will give it away is later, when the lions do get a little bit more active, they start moving at around 6 o'clock. So if we do, we don't have to give up the look for the lion now. Sometimes they can really help us to find them in the evenings because they like to get up, they like to start scent marking and start roaring. And that roar is not a very small sound. You can really hear it from the other side of the bush. I mean, I can hear it in my bed when I'm sleeping at night time. So we can very, very well follow up on that sound. So we should be okay. Just looking up every now and then just to see if there could be something lurking there. 
One never knows. Always got to have ears out and eyes out. So I'm glad to see that my ear is recovering a bit more so I can hear the different sounds in the bush. But I can really smell that lion poo, especially now more than ever. Just gotta keep a look around. I'll also be listening for any crest Franklins or any alarm calls of the monkey. Not particularly, the monkey will mainly alarm call at a, at, a, at a leopard as it walks through. The lion is often maybe like a spurfowl or a Franklin. There's not many sounds that are coming out from here. But we'll do a loop and we'll see if we can find those beautiful lions. But have you seen a young hippo before? I know that Jamie's seen a hippo before, or the young one at least, and it's not something you often see. So that's even, like for me, that's even more exciting because it's not often we see this young hippo, especially with, with a larger one in the watering hole. And they could very well be out of the water. See, see, there's some, track, there's some tracks here that head off here. So this is gonna have been where the lines were earlier. Richard Holmes would like to know, is there any news on those Nkuhuma cubs from that lioness? You know, there is absolutely, you know, there's no news on those Nkuhumas. I don't think, I don't know, she hasn't been on the, the property lately. So I'm not sure if she's given birth to those lion cubs yet. I don't, I don't think so. But I would love to know, trust me. I, I was sitting there, I, I would have thought that that lioness was ready to give birth probably around two weeks ago. But no such thing. I'm very excited though. I can't wait to, to see a lion cub for the first time at a young age, you know, at a very, very young age. It'll be super interesting to see the, the, that dynamic. No problem. You were saying thank you for the line track. No problem. It's really cool to show and learn all about the different tracks that are around here. I mean, we'll show you some more if we find some later. But it is honestly one of the most incredible things when you find tracks and you follow them and you smell things and you listen to everything that's going on. It's a, as I said, an ongoing investigation on finding out what's going on in the bush here. But I'm starting to notice how the trees are starting to change color as the autumn period to set in. And the one, the one plant that's actually evergreen that doesn't, that doesn't kind of grow old, not old, sorry, that has an autumn, is the buffalo thorn. Let's see if I can find any buffalo thorn. It's the one that I pretty much, there's two plants as you would have noticed by now that I sometimes always do on the children's shows is the silver cluster leaf and the buffalo thorn just because I like to eat that buffalo thorn I think it tastes quite nice and these plants that we are seeing now are all round leaf teaks all the way on the right here and these are the plants I'll show you it so these are pterocarpus so Elvis the Ellie would like to eat this plant, the round leaf teak. And I'll just show you a quick little bit of a little bit of biomimicry here while we've got this leaf. Have a look at this. Look at with that sun behind it, it actually makes it even look cooler. So if you have a look at all the different veins on that leaf, that leaf structure, that is the most efficient way in which water will be decentralized around the leaf. So it's called Murray's Law, which is following the path of least resistance to bring water to the different parts of the leaf. And they're actually beginning to design towns and city planning 
in such a way that could decentralize leaves in the same way in which leaves do. So isn't that fascinating? So from a round leaf tick that gets eaten by obviously Ellie to clever designs from the natural world that can begin to bring a little bit more efficiency to the way in which we see systems in the natural world. So that's what I... Okay, so we're going to carry on to see if we can find not only that small hippo again, but the lion and all the lettuce. So we're going to carry on working this area. Let's go and find out how Brent's doing with his tracking. So we went for a little walk. We didn't see any sign of tracks, but there's been some elephants and buffalo around that could have obliterated the tracks. So we did hear some elephants screaming uh, quite aggressively towards the Cheetah Plains plan. So we came back to the vehicle and we're going to go see Maybe they're shouting at a leopard, more than likely they're shouting at each other. But even if it's not a leopard there, it'll be wonderful to see some elephants. And a nice big male kudu. Oh, he doesn't look like he's hanging around there. But he's going to keep walking. And I'm going to try to get to those elephants, especially if they're at the water hole. They could be playing in the mud. something quickly. I've just heard something on the radio. Hold on guys. Have confirmed my Dutch. Ah, uh, copy thanks. Sorry, I misheard F from there. I thought he said Inja and I thought Inja dog. Maybe wild dogs, but it's not. It's some ostriches. So uh, we, we will probably see them a little later, uh, but let's go have a look if we can find those eddies that were making all that noise first. It sounded like they were right here at the waterhole, or not. It has the cheetah plane's pan. It doesn't even look like there have been elephants here too recently. We would see oh, there is a bit of dampness there. Beautifully still afternoon. You can see there's not even a ripple in the water. There's just a couple of Cape turtle doves fluttering about. So, so beautiful. Might be a little bit further to the northwest. And we're definitely in this general area, but we do want to check this area regardless for that leopard. Now, we haven't seen, had or had too many leopard sightings on cheetah plains. I've had two. I think Sam's had one. I'm not sure. I think Jamie, Jamie hasn't had one yet. Neither has James with leopard. But they've definitely had better cheetah luck than I have out here. And the four different leopards I've seen on cheetah plains has been quarantine and in Kanyin and her two cubs.
Hi Monique in London. Hope you're having a wonderful weekend on the Mud Island. Uh, Monique is wondering what is the difference between a leopard and jaguar? Are the rosettes different? Is there different behavior? The rosettes are quite similar. Jaguars are generally quite uh, a bit more tightly packed. They're generally darker in color as well. The major difference is they are a lot bigger. Uh, a jaguar is a lioness sized animal and they show some incredibly interesting behaviors that they swim. They spend a lot of time in the water. They like the water. They even hunt from the water and they even hunt caiman, which is a type of crocodilian that occurs in South America. But their favorite food of all is the capybara, which is, if I remember my memory serves me correctly, the world's largest rodent. So while we keep scouring cheetah plans for this mystery leopard, uh, Sam has got an amphibious creature to show you. Here we are with two hippos. So I'm so excited to have shown you this small little hippo that's over here. There we go. You can see him playing with his ear in the water there. So it's one large hippo and one smaller hippo. So this is at Buffelshoek Dam. And if we're lucky, we might just see, oh, isn't that cool? See that spray? That's exactly what I was going to say. There we go. And they're not the only lonely people here at the dam. There's also a nice, good looking buffalo that's here. So we have some hippo, a buffalo that's resting very, very calmly over here. I would be careful though, because there are some lions in the area and you're the only buffalo in the area. So just be a little bit careful down by the watering hole, Mr. Buffalo. This has been a spe was a special sighting the other day. So we've seen everything that came down by the watering hole. We often find these buffalo down at the watering hole and they were all sitting, there must have been about four or five of them. They were sitting in the, in the mud, mud wallow here and they started playing and, and hitting their bosses in the, the water and the mud and, and it was really cool to see that. But then all of a sudden a breeding herd of about 50 to 60 elephants came in and they started going well, they started going crazy in the water. Lots of fun, lots of drinking. There was two elephants that were fighting and it actually pushed all these el elder dugger boys out of the water, which was, which was fascinating to see. But the hippos were here during all that, or well, a hippo was there during that experience with all those elephants and it didn't even budge. I think it, it did have one amazing yawn, but it didn't really, really worry about those elephants. Francie in Oregon would like to know, do hippos have toes? And if possible, can I see some tracks? Well, of course, Francie in Oregon, I'm going to see if I can get my book out here to show you some tracks of a hippo. It's so cool to see a young hippo with an elder one. It really isn't common that we get to see this. At least, maybe it is, but it's not common for me. I've only been here for six weeks. So if we come back up to the vehicle quickly, we have a look over here to the bottom right. 24 centimeters plus minus is how big they can get. So they have four, four finger, almost finger looking toes there. So those are four toes of the hippo and that's how large they get. So they're 24 centimeters, which is pretty big. It's a very, very big track that you get and you'll often find them on the road in the mornings because hippos come out during the daytime and when they come out during the day or they come out during the night time and at daytime you'll find them in the watering holes at night time you'll find them inside the thick areas the thick bush feeding and grazing on grass and then when the daylight comes they come and they sit in the watering hole because they don't like the sun the sun gets a little bit too hot for them and they like to be resting in this watering hole so that's why they're here So 24 centimeters is around 9.4, 9.4 centimeters.
9.4, sorry, let me just... 9.4 inches. <laughs> That's what it is. So it's around 9.4 inches, the size of a hippo track. 24 centimeters, 9.4 inches. Have a look at those ears. So most, most mammals and animals out here, you'll find that their ears are a lot different to ours in the sense that ours stick in one place and, and hear sound around, whereas a hippo can actually move their ear from side to side and hear all the different things that might be going on in the bush around it. So in the distance, before we carry on about ears, we can see a three-banded plover that looks like it's eating and feeding there, walking nice and slowly across the waterine area there. And there's something else that's floating in the water. That could be a terrapin. It just lifted its head and then it kind of started swimming away. Wow, so when you really start looking around, you can see way more than just the big hippos in the water. It's quite interesting. Sometimes we'll come down to the water, water in the afternoon and we'll find a number of terrapins sitting on the back of the hippo, sometimes four to five, which is so cool to see. And I'm, I was always wondering why the terrapins sit on top of the hippos. I think it is to collect some sunlight, especially in the cold mornings that we get out here in the bush. Look how relaxed these hippos are. Do you ever get days like this where you can just relax so hard in the water? These guys are the masters of relaxing in the water. And they have no real, no predators in the water, so they can just spend their time, look after their energy, and then get out at night time and start feeding. And so you would have thought that hippos liked to eat fish and are carnivorous, but they're actually not. They're very much water they're creatures. Well, they're water creatures, but they like to come out at night time to graze on grass. When I was a young boy, I used to think, wow, these guys must eat a lot of fish. But they didn't eat any fish. And that came from that story, that African folktale of how the hippos ended up in the watering areas. I've said it a few times, but I'll say it quickly again around how the hippo came to water. Look, look, there, you can quite clearly see the eyes. It's going to have maybe a spray. There we go. Awesome. So the hippo, in, well, from the folk stories of the sand bushman, was said to be a land creature. And it used to move about the, about the land, but every single, every single day it would get burnt and get way too hot in the sun. And eventually it was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I need to go to the water gods, which was the kingfisher, the fish eagle, and the, and the otter. He said, please, 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 can I go and sit in the water. I'm getting so burnt out here in the sun. And the water gods were like, listen, Mr. Hippo and Mrs. Hippo, I don't think you can, you can do that because you're going to go to the watering holes and you're just going to eat all the fish. I can't give this, this to you. You can't go there. And the hippo just started crying. He was like, please, I'm burning in the sun every day. Please, can you just let me go in the water? So the gods felt pity, pity for this, for these hippo. And they said, OK. You've got one chance, and if you, if you start eating meat, you're out of the water. So the hippo went into the waterine areas and never ate one fish. And to prove to the gods that he didn't eat any fish, they would scatter their dung much like hippos do and show that there were no fish bones in the dung. Isn't that cool? So hopefully at some point I'll get to show you some of the dung that's spread out around the bush, and you'll see how they do actually spray they dung. This is the way in which they do that. It's kind of also scent marking. Termi would like to know how, how, for how long can hippos hold their breath underwater for? Well, for in all, all books, they tell you different things. You know, I've read a few books that have said a couple minutes. Some have said like around seven minutes, but I think it is around three to four minutes that a hippo can hold its breath underwater for. So I've read a whole bunch of things that tell you different things, and that's why you should never really 
believe everything you read. Sometimes you must experience it. So I wonder if we could sit here one day with the hippo and actually count for how long it can hold its breath down there for. And then we'll really know. But these stories that we, we hear about the African bush felt and all of this, about the sand folklore is incredible because it, it teaches you a lot. You know, it might just be a story, but in that story we can learn a lot. So hopefully I can tell you some more stories. I have a great one about ostriches and all the different things, but let's see if we can see those animals and then I'll tell the stories. But in the time being, let's go and see how Brent is doing tracking on cheetah plains. So really exciting. We've found the tracks, but these are not male tracks. They're female tracks. And We've got tracks going in both directions. I thought I saw some cub tracks a little bit earlier. So this could be in Kanyin. And uh, they're going both directions. So I'm hoping she's got a kill here. So we're going to have a quick look around here. I just wanted to show you these exquisite, fresh female leopard tracks before we disappeared for a little bit. But we will be back, hopefully, within Kanyin and even better with two babies. So while we try to find you this leopard, let's jump back on board with Sam and those wonderful hippos. So you are straight back with Sam and Dave after a fantastic time down there by the watering hole where we told a story about hippos and we saw a three banded plover, which we've seen a few times. So I'm sure that's not a new bird for some of our, our birders out there. We're gonna see if we can locate on these lines. We're gonna do a nice loop Elvis, which way should we go? Elvis thinks we should go left, and I stalled as Elvis made that decision. It's always nice to stall. <laughs> now Rebecca says that I shouldn't blame Elvis. I'll take, I'll take the fall for that one. It's not your fault, Elvis. You're just a little toy for my car. So let's see if we can locate on those lines. It would be quite exciting if we can. What I'm going to do now is just do a nice loop of this area and then come back down on the road where they were seen this morning and potentially we could pick up some more of those tracks and follow. Tony's asking, would you consider the hippo the most dangerous animal in Africa? Tony, I would most definitely say that. Uh, oh, sorry, the most dangerous mother. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that, yes, without a doubt. Um, the hippo, I mean, I had a, one of my really good friends that I trained with actually got hit by a, a hippo as it was running to a watering hole. I'm not too sure what actually happened with the whole story, but she got hit and the tooth of the hippo went in, into her arm and she got really, really badly injured. She had to be taken out by helicopter. I wasn't sure if that was a female or a male hippo. It's the most attacks that are on humans in Africa are from hippos. Yeah, so you've got to be very careful of the hippo. They might like to relax in the water, but if you find a hippo outside of water, it just panics. Straight out panics sometimes. You must never ever be in between the water and a hippo when, when that happens. It's not a good idea, I'm telling you that. So that's why you've just got to be so aware when walking in the bush. That's why I love it actually. It teaches you to be present when you're walking through here. So I'm just also paying attention for any tracks. I mean, I would love to find those Birmingham boys. If we come across anything else that's even more spectacular, that's fine. We also saw, I mean, we saw hornbills eating on a big locust the other day, which was, which was really, really cool to see that. I really enjoy when you see things that you would normally not see, you know, when you, when you come across a log and there's a spider inside or you come across a tree and there's a bird eating something you didn't think it would eat. Those, those things are the things that really give me energy out here. You learn something you didn't know about the bush. One thing I do know is those lions are most likely sleeping. <laughs> Somewhere in the thicket over there, those lions having a good rest. 
but their time to wake up will be a couple of hours time. You should be able to hear their calls. Which would be exciting. Let's see what we have around this corner. So, so remember, we've seen a number of whiteback vultures in this area. Quite a few times, really, and I think there's a couple of nests. So what, what would be really interesting is we, if we can spend time with some of the whiteback vultures, especially during the season now that they start having hatching eggs. That, that's something I haven't seen as a, as a young vulture. I mean, how many of you have seen a, a young vulture? So I'm always paying attention to see if we can find any nests of these whiteback vultures. You see a young vulture, it'd be super interesting to see how it's fed, you know, because I mean, when I was in the in the Cedarberg and I spent time underneath the, underneath the, the mountains of the Cedarberg, there's a buffalo that's over there. You can just see through this thicket. I'm going to go slowly. Have a look at that buffalo that's sitting just there. So they love these areas, the thick green bush where they can come and eat, relax, and they can't keep up with the big breeding herds anymore. So close to water at Buffelsook, close to very, very lush green grass, and that makes them very, very, very happy, happy buffalo bulls. And they do like to eat that soft grass because their teeth starts getting quite old and it starts to rot their teeth. So the lusher grass they can find, the better. But just while I'm here, I've just found a bug that's crawled up onto my mantelpiece that I would love to show you. I don't know where he came from. I have absolutely no idea what it is. There he is, and I've got a fly. So what, does anyone know what this is? If you know the answer to this beetle, it's got such a magnificent color. Sorry, I'm just moving it so that you might be able to see it again. If anyone knows what the name of this beetle is, I would really, really be interested to know. Please hashtag Safari Live. Let me know what beetle you think that is. Small, magnificent things of the natural world. I'm just gonna put you over here. Oops. Actually, I'm going to put them outside. It's not nice. Let's not leave them in the car with us. He's a very, very small creature. I wonder what he was. He looked like a really small type of dung beetle. He had a very metallic kind of look. So we're going to leave this big buffalo we now know where he is if we do find the lions a little bit later we'll know that there is a buffalo resting up in this area that's actually got it that's a nice thing about driving before finding lions there's more buffalo that are actually down there you can't see them at the moment so don't worry it's about a number two or three there four i can see a couple I'll show you when you get to the road. They might be there. No, they won't. They're deep in the thick bush there, so we know that there are full buffaloes in the area. We're going to drive Cheetah Cut Line now, which is the road that we're coming to. We're going to go see if we can find any tracks there. And if we don't find any tracks, that's okay. We'll see what else we can find out here in the beautiful African bush. I really thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed doing that section on stars the other day. Please let me know if you enjoy doing more stars and and when we're doing it, I'd love I'd love for you to to kind of send me. You can send them to my Facebook page if you're interested in stars, and we can learn a little bit more about about what the galaxies are and the nebulas. So next time we're doing a star talk, please let me know what it is that you are quite interested in talk a little bit more about stars because the reason why I'm saying and bringing this up is that 
I've just realized that with that camera that we have now, we have the ability to see way more than we normally can. We can really see the belt of Orion and the galaxies in the distance, so especially like nebulas, like you would never be able to see a nebula. But I can show you in the night sky where they might be. Right. got some elephant dung just in front of us. Could very well be a few elephants in the area. I was explaining a bit earlier, they like the round leaf ticks, which is these plants that are around us. That's something, while we often come here, we find lots of elephants. I mean, that breeding herd that came down to Buffelswood was very, very significant. It's definitely the largest breeding herd I've seen. And then to see two that were fighting. I mean, we, so I posted on my Rewild page and, and we got a few comments back about it. And I think, you know, it started off as play, but then it started to get very, very aggressive because only after watching it the second time, with the thing I watched it with Jean Ray when we went back, and we noticed that there was holes in his cheek, so he was bleeding. So it turned out to be quite a fight. But what a special, a special thing to witness. I mean, even after we left, 10 minutes later, we were looking for something else and we bumped into those honey badgers. We could hear, we could hear the sound of those elephants still fighting for quite some time. Which was very, very, very fascinating. So I can't see any tracks at the moment. Scott's asking me, what is the rarest animal you've seen on a drive? Well, Scott, I'm, the, rarest, the rarest animal that I would have seen here is the honey badger um, at Juma. But the rarest animal that I've seen in my life is probably the odd wolf, which I saw in, in the Cedarburg. And I didn't even expect to see it. it was, it was, quite, it was quite, a, quite an experience to find this odd wolf. Very, very different looking creature. I do that. It almost looks like it's part of the Hyundai family. Hyena Day family. And so you get the striped hyena, the spotted hyena, and the brown hyena, and then you get the odd wolf. No one ever knows about the odd wolf. I mean, to be honest, I hardly knew anything on the odd wolf until I saw it. And then I went and looked in my book, in my mammal's book, and I was like, this is. This is actually a real animal and it was just fascinating to see that it, you know it doesn't like much like the other hyenas like to to see each other the brown and bales they can uh, like associate with each other every now and then but the the the, the odd wolf doesn't like it at all it gets away as soon as it can from any any interaction with the other hyenas and it also doesn't eat meat it eats termites so the odd wolf just purely eats termites so that's Probably the most fascinating creature that I've seen in my time. And probably the rarest. So let's go to Brent quickly for a cameo update. We're gonna go down here and see if we can find some more tracks of that male line. So we've got tracks of both, it looks like both cubs and in canyon and we're just trying to figure out exactly where they went and she we think she's crossed into this quite a big block here and we're gonna go check on a little two track here and go around make sure she hasn't possibly tried to pop down to the water hole for a drink and maybe been chased by those elephants which is a very strong possibility so i'm going to keep checking very carefully the fact that we've got tracks going in both directions makes me quite excited. It means there could be a kill in the area. I just look at this gorgeous light. And it is an absolutely beautiful winter's evening. And no doubt it's winter now. Quite chilly. Aaron's 
noted that cougars had a lot more sons than daughters. And I was wondering, is that common in leopards? I, I think it just depends on the individual. Some, some leopards uh, have more, more females, others have more males. Uh, I wouldn't say it's common or uncommon, it's just the way Karula is. Now, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to catch some leopard cubs in this exquisite light? We're checking every termite mound, we're checking up in the big marulas where she might want to hoist the tree. Well, Anne's wondering <laughs> if, if the, an animal happens to lie on a termite mound, is it possible that the termites might bite them? Well, Anne, uh, it is definitely possible. Uh, but generally, you'll notice leopards and that will normally lie on termite mounds that are no longer active, or they won't lie on those sort of tunnels that they open chimneys that the termites are working on. So we're going to now do another loop around this little block. So we're making the block smaller and smaller and hopefully that is going to lead us to a leopard. So I'd be really excited. I know Jandra is probably the most excited because he's never seen in Canyon and the Cubs. So. I know his eyes are peeled, mine are peeled. Just checking very, very carefully now. I know Ephraim's moving into the area to give us a hand as well. We're going to keep making the circle smaller, so to speak, and hopefully we do come up with some luck with Incanyon and the Cubs. But while we do that, let's jump back on board with Sam. So welcome back, everyone. We're just looking to see if we could. We just found tracks. Just so we're just looking here to see if the mail line could be anywhere here. Gonna look in this look in this thicket over here to see if we can find it. And the female line seems to be over there. We'll, what we'll do is we're just gonna drive along here one more time and look into the thicket. Because I did find tracks moving off in this direction. So, just look along there. Can you see anything poking up there, Dave? No, I don't. Okay, let's go back onto the road. Maybe we can find lost tracks. So, it's, it's most likely that this line is lying up somewhere over there, deep there, in this block underneath a piece of, underneath a piece of shade. See if we can find some more. Maybe the, the thing is, maybe he's walked back onto the road. We might be able to spot him in the thicket there somewhere. So we're doing our best here to see if we can spot you, Birmingham boy. And, you know, it's actually quite difficult this time of day. The male line has that, that, that very similar color to that of the sun, you know, so you can quite easily blend into that background, especially if it's lying up underneath the bush, so I've really got to use my eyes.
doesn't seem to be any lion there. No worries. Let's just continue down on our merry road, down Drakensberg. Let's see what else we might be able to find. So everyone's quite excited to do some stars this evening. I'm really excited about that. Uh, that's my favorite thing to do and talk about. We obviously have to wait until it gets quite a bit darker before we can really start doing the stars. So I think it was Sarah that would like to know a little bit more about the stars, but also what is the best time of year to view stars? Well, Sarah, um, the best time of year to view stars, I would say, is, is in June, July. So we're coming up to June and we'll see if we can We'll, we will definitely, I'll practice doing it more and more in the future, but it's that time of year because that's our winter season and that's when it gets dark much quickly as well. And the best place in South Africa to view them is probably around the Cedarburg where I used to work or around Sutherland. So those are the best areas to really, really do some stargazing. And it's fascinating. I really love to learn more about stars. My favorite stars is Rigel and Beetlejuice and part of the whole Orion constellation. So you guys must let me know, just send through hashtag Safari Live, what would you really like to look at out in the night sky tonight? And we'll see if we can find it. We'll see if we can point out, you know, talk more about Alpha and Beta Centauri, the pointer stars. I can teach you how to find south, um, out here in the Southern Hemisphere with the Southern Cross. So that's the way in which we tell south. We can go do a little bit about Scorpio. Um, Scorpio is going to be arising out in the east this evening. and. Orion's going to be out on the west and Mars should be somewhere around there and of course like when we tell Mars out in the distance Mars is a, a planet that is red so it really glows red in the distance and it's beautiful to see especially with the camera that we've got at the moment so we're going to do our best to try and show you that this evening which will be exciting which will be very very exciting I can tell you though, when you, you just, you can never know what you're going to see out here in the bush. It's, it's really, really quite incredible, you know. That, that afternoon where those honey badgers just ran into your road, you just can't predict that. You just can just only drive one day and expect it might, that it might happen. Because this is actually the same road that James saw the serval on. Can you imagine how incredible that must have been to you, view the serval? Wow, for so long as he did, he, he watched the serval for over five minutes. And it really isn't easy to experience an animal like that. Well, we've got a beautiful looking at yarn and it's walking out in the bush there. There's two of them there. So there's an Inyala. That's what Inyala likes to hide in is those thick, thick bushes. And you can see those nice white lines on, the, on its body and I'll help it hide in this bush felt. Beautiful, beautiful antelopes. I really, really loved seeing them. And also just seeing the difference between the male and the female. And that male has such an incredible looking kind of design to it. And I really, really love design. I mean, you know, design influences our whole life you know, from everything that we do. And just understanding the way in which that the Inyala is designed to fit into this wilderness and, and the difference between the design of the male and the female is just very, very extraordinary, very, very different to most things that you might see in the bush here. Everything has its own kind of self-actualization, self-purpose in terms of how it's, how it's made into those different colors. I mean, we are talking about the beautiful, the beautiful coloration of moths and all those magical things out there. Ooh. Amazing from a distance. Okay, so we've got quite a few things going on here. We've got a, a, a group of dwarf mongoose. We've got a whole family of crested franklins. So let's start off with the crested franklins because they're right here. They're just to the right of us here. They look like some really young ones here. I'm going to move slowly because they're going to be quite scared of us. But they're very, very small. So let's see if we can see them again. Can you see one there? We can't see one there. Let's just move a little bit forward. I 
think they could actually be lying underneath this tree. So they're quite scared of us, so it makes sense to why they might be lying under the tree. So you can see the mother walking around, protecting her young. I have no idea where they went. So she's a very clever mom, wherever she took her children. Unless you can see them there in the distance. Ooh. Can you hear that sound? It's the sound of two impalas in the distance. So I thought that was an alarm call, but it's still the rutting season. So you can see those young crested Franklins now. Very, very sweet. Very, very cool to see that. And not only... Wait, they, now we can quite clearly see them. Well, no, we can't clearly. They're through the grasses there. They're very sweet. There we go. Beautiful little crested Franklins. Following mother very, very closely. And they've got to be careful of all sorts of predators that might kill them, such as eagles and owls and all those many different creatures. And there's also an interesting interaction here as we, as we sit here. If we have a look here, let's start at the, the, the hornbill that's just up here to the left of us. So this is a, a little bit of symbiosis that, we, that you can quite often see. Where is it? Is, sorry, Dave, it's just in this tree here. You'll see it cleaning, its, cleaning itself there. And the reason why I'm starting off with this hornbill that's in the tree, Bottom, bottom left of the screen, you'll see. So there he is. He's in the middle of your screen now, behind that tree. So he was camouflaged in that tree. So that hornbill, the reason why I brought um, you into the attention of the hornbill is purely because there's a relationship that's going on here out in the bush between this yellow-billed hornbill, or otherwise known as a flying banana, <laughs> and the mongoose that are be below it. And they have an interaction where mongoose will act as an alarm system for all sorts of, or for the mongoose that are below it. So if we look carefully, we might be able to see those mongoose that are just below this hornbill. And that's almost like a sound alarm system for these mongoose, as they will then start collecting insects from the ground. So the mongooses are just at the end of this tree here, lying up in together on top of a mound and I just quickly saw that in the distance there's a whole group of dwarf mongoose here and that's so cool I just spotted them from a distance so there's a little bit of an interaction here between the two and I think if we just stand still for a bit maybe we'll see the interaction between the hornbill and the mongoose Maybe these mongoose will start leaving that little area there and start feeding around there and we'll start seeing the hornbill come down and collect some food after the mongoose because that's the relationship that they hold, that the mongoose will start looking for food and in doing so will start disturbing insects out of their holes and then the hornbill will benefit from those flying insects. And at the same time, those mongoose will be benefiting as that alarm system in the tree there. A nice little group of crested Franklins to a hornbill in a tree to a number of mongoose beneath them. So fascinating as you spend time with all the different systems and relationships of the natural world. So that's very, very cool. It looks like they're probably going to be sitting there for quite some time. But it was nice to see that, that little bit of interaction between a mongoose and a hornbill. But as we drive past here, let's go, let's go quite slowly. Maybe we can get to see the mongoose up a little bit closer and understand and well, just to see what their home looks like a bit more. See, they're getting very nervous as I come past. Maybe if I just... It's a little bit right in front of the car now. So I'm just going to reverse so that Dave has a nice view of it. There we go. 
So now, now we're looking at what looks like an old termite mound. And you can very, very clearly see the small little mongoose that's just popped its head up on the, uh, on the top left there. And there's the second one. So they're getting comfortable now. They're like, oh, whatever that sound is, I think it's gone. <laughs> Sweet. It's really nice to spend some time with these dwarf mongoose. There's three of them that are out at the moment. So these termite mounds will be used by a number of different creatures out here, from aardwolf to even honey badgers, to all sorts of animals, the aardvark. And a lot of them actually eat the termites. So not only do they eat the termites, but they live in the dwellings of termite mounds. So you can really understand that relationship of how termites provide such a rich base of nutrients to all the animals of the natural environment. And these mongoose not only just spend time where they are now, they spend time in many, many different dwellings around here. So they've probably got around 10 different homes. And during the day they'll or every second day or so, or every day, they'll jump between home to home. And creating diversity in their homes allows them to have a little bit more resilience against the predators. The predators don't know where they've gone. And fascinating, you actually learned, I was reading up on these dwarf mongoose, and they're quite similar to meerkats in the sense that they also have sentinels, which means one of the mongoose will come out and show will we'll look around for any predator while they start feeding, which is quite interesting. You'll see them standing on their hind feet, looking around for any predator that might be in the area. Look at that small little nose. So sweet. So very, very, very interesting looking creatures. And these are our social, our social kind of group of mongoose. So you get some of the, the mongoose that aren't as social as this, that live in gregarious groups like the slender mongoose and the white-tailed mongoose. So if we're lucky, we might be able to see a white-tailed mongoose this evening. So, sweet little mongooses. It's great to have spent some time with them this evening before we we started looking and hearing for any lion activity that might be happening in the distance. So we can spend some time with these diurnal, diurnal creatures during the day. And when the night comes, when those owls come, we might just be able to spot some of those owls that would eat mongoose such as this. That's their dwelling. That's their home. So let's, let's begin to carry on after we look at this mongoose. Let's have a last little look at this mongoose. Have a look at the hair, the ants that are crawling around in the background there. Look at the smelling. Look how it, so it looks like he's smelling something. Those little claws, you can see the little claws of, of the mongoose there. They're so small that that must be to help them dig and forage for any insects in the ground. That's beautiful, great filming there, Dave. So now we can quite clearly see all the different characteristics of this dwarf mongoose. From that little nose, this. So, I think to help you even to see a difference between things out here, so you've just seen how small that Little, little toes are, those little feet are. I'm just going to get a track out from my book and show you the track of a dwarf mongoose. And then you can really, really put things together. Here we go. So that's the dwarf mongoose. It's only plus or minus two centimeters big. Bottom left, right here. Dwarf mongoose there. So that is the dwarf mongoose. 
So that's a difference. So when we go looking for the white-tailed mongoose, which is this one over here, that's six centimeters big. Plus minus six centimeters big. But there's quite a big difference between the two. And as I said, that's a solitary mongoose that will move around on its own. So what a cool sighting we just had of those little dwarf mongooses and those small little crested franklins. Let's move forward and see if we can see any others. Sorry, dwarfs, I didn't mean to give you a fright as I switched on my car. We'll see you a bit later. Awesome. So it looks like there's been quite a few elephants. If you look in the front here, there's huge elephant activity. You can see the ground is quite, quite, quite broken up. There's a lot of elephant dung there, or quite a bit there. Trees that are broken down. There's dirt on the leaves to the left. And if you look at that, that leaf system over there, you'll see some mud all over there. So there's a lot of tracks and sign of some elephants that have just walked to this area. There we go. So let's move on. Let's be aware that there might just be some elephants in there. Albus, the Ellie is definitely getting quite excited. And there's a magical sunset that's about a, about a start going off. And we'll show you that sunset as it gets a little bit deeper. This is another perfect example, just to our left here, of how termite mounds can really differ in coloration from that really rich dark soil to that kind of oldish soil at the top there. And over time, when, when this stops getting used, so this is an active termite mound, you'll start to find more, ho more holes in this termite mound, which would then um, create you know, holes and cavices in here. And then you'll find other animals that like to live in there, such as the dwarf mongoose that we've just seen. So showing you, showing you these termite mounds and dwarf, dwarf mongooses in the termite mound, can really give you an idea for how much, how much of an influence these termites have on this landscape. You can see them on trees, you can see them pretty much in all sorts of places. So there's a beautiful light that's now coming out onto the savannah this evening. Just going to get an update to see if anything has been found. Good evening stations, can I please get an update from Weatella? Have a look at that sun just before we, it goes down over there, just because this is quite a nice area. I mean, it's quite bright at the moment. So there's the sun that's just going down over that area. After another beautiful day in the African bush, So it's still got some time to go down, but that still looks so magical. It's incredible what these cameras can do. So that's a beautiful look of the sun this evening as we drive slowly but surely down towards the areas where potentially some leopard activity might be. And I just asked on the radio that no one's found anything. So we're going to carry on down this road and see what we might be able to find. Brent has just come back onto Juba. Let's go find out his story and how things are going with him. So isn't this light beautiful? The sun setting. We're heading back west towards Juma. Now, we're very confident in Canyon and those cubs are there. We just don't have the time to follow up this evening. So I definitely think it's a worthwhile mission for the morning. And we'll definitely take Hubert with us and put them out on those tracks. So what we're hoping, because she's gone into a really big block, is that she's gonna go for a drink during the night. So that'll give us a place to start, Cheetah Plains Pants. She might have left the cubs in the morning.
sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gari repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. We are back on board with Dave and Sam now. We are currently going from that beautiful sunset that we just saw. And we're actually going to turn left here, not down into the drainage line. Because I think it will be worthwhile just going back on Chile Cut Line. Potentially some of those lines have crossed and we can have a look and see if there's any tracks there. It would make me very excited if we can end our drive with some wonderful looking lines. And if we don't, of course, that's not the point of the safari. The point of the safari is to show you the wonderful things of the natural world, both big and small. So we'll see if we can find anything else that might be small, nocturnal, and difficult to find. Because that's what gives me the excitement. Linda would like to know what makes that dark or rich darkness on some of the termite mounds that we find. Linda, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's just much fresher soil. So I would presume that it's the minerals from the soil that they go and get. So it's the, the soil that they got before is just the same sort of soil, but it's, it's much older. And sometimes they will go and collect you know, soils that have seeds in them that are, are quite fertile. And that's why we often find some trees that are very, very fertile in that area. And like a brown ivory, for example, we often find a brown ivory, which is always quite exciting. Well, I say exciting just because it's a difficult little tree to find. Have a look at this, wow. And this tree, our right here, has really been taken down by an elephant. You can see that it is very much dead because there are no green leaves on this marula tree, but you can see all around it, a whole bunch of branches, there's bark on the floor. And you know what, I'm just gonna you know, get out for one second, just to show you. So it's incredible what they actually manage to do, elephants. They, they're able to, to come across and rip into the bark here and get to this fertile, well, really good, rich cambium layer that's beneath here but the tree itself is only able to bring and bring water and nutrients through this cambium layer that's between the bark that protects it and the actual tree itself so that cambium layer has been stripped off by the elephants and of course that's otherwise known as ring barking and that kills the tree but we spoke about it a little bit with children the other day on the child drive eventually what this what will happen to this tree is something similar to what that termite mound happens. So this tree might even be taken up by a number of termites that then create a mound inside of the tree itself. And then it'll patch up holes around if there's any holes in there. But eventually over time, this tree may break and fall down and a number of insects will begin to inhabit that, that tree, such as spiders and snakes and all the different things. So, in nature, everything is used again. So I just jumped up there. Nothing gets put to waste. So it's magical when you start to see that. So let's carry on. Maybe we can find ourselves some elephants. So we're going to go and drive down this road and see if we can find anything. And let's go see our brakes doing.
So we're stalking a beast that doesn't know he's being stalked. I think he's got a similar idea. We're looking for the same animal, but she'll see if we can sneak up upon them. See how aware they are. You've got to keep your head low when you're stalking. Sam has called me on the radio and asked me, what is my position? Sam, um, I'm back from CP and I'm uh, quite close to you. He still hasn't figured out we're stalking him. And neither is dangerous Dave. Here we go, boo. Still nothing. Sam, what's your position? This is quite funny now, guys. So we're gonna try. Sam, Sam, what's your position? Let's go see. We're gonna come. We're both looking for the lion at the moment. So we're both around here. So we finished our stalk of Sam and Dave and they did not notice us behind them for the last uh, 100, just 200 gave meters. Me such a fright. <laughs> we were just wondering, should we go down this road to see if we can find those lions? And we thought that's why I wanted to get a hold of you. So see if you can we, find that. We lion. we were talking to you while driving behind you. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Anyway, Jean-Ray, while you film us, go see if you can find those lights. Yes. Um, no tracks coming across Chilicata, no? No, I've been looking. Very cool. They must be still in between here and... and must have moved position. Either I didn't see Well, you could be there. flat under a bush. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go have a look. Bye, guys. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the little imp on my shoulder made me do it. <laughs> So we're both in the area looking for that male lion we saw this morning. Now, I'm still wanting to look for that mating pair, but I think I'm gonna wait for it to get a little bit darker before we go down there. I'm really hoping that the one thing they do need while mating is water. So they might move towards the Juma Dam Cam. So guys, please keep an eye out for me uh, and let me know immediately if those lions pop up on the Juma Dam Cam. So unfortunately we lost signal while I was explaining why we left uh, tracking that female there. But she went into a big block, but we're quite confident she might have a kid in there because she's brought the cubs. So we want to go back when we've got a, a lot of daylight. We're going to take Hubert, security slash tracking team, and we're going to send him off on the last set of tracks or if we can find even more fresh tracks tomorrow morning. So give him a radio and then we can carry on checking around Cheetah Plains and Hubert can focus on finding those leopards for us. Okay, so that lion was sleeping just up here. Good evening, Christine from North Carolina. Uh, Christine's heard conflicting reports whether we are in a malaria area or not. This is classified as a malaria area, but a low risk malaria area. So uh, generally one says if you are coming out this part of the world, uh, take your GP's advice. Uh, none of us who live out here take malaria prophylactics. 
Now, to take prophylactics for malaria for extended periods of time would be worse for, for us than actually just getting malaria. But, and quite often, oh, as I hate to say this, but my dad has some very good sayings. One of his favorites is, malaria is not serious if you treat it seriously. Now, that always makes it a little bit easier if you know what the symptoms are. And I mean, almost immediately we can pick up whether we've, whether well, I know for, if I've got malaria within a couple of minutes. <laughs> not quite that, but when I wake up in the morning, swell, uh, swollen spleen, achy joints, basically very cold and flu-like symptoms without having the flu. Now, he was sleeping under a weeping waffle just in here earlier today, so just checking very carefully through here. Got it. Here he is. He's still... There we go. Still still in the same place. Yeah. Yes, so he's lying um, where we left him this morning under the, the weeping waffle. Let's just sneak through. Are you sure, Jean? Yeah. Yep. But this is oh, exactly, he literally has not moved uh, a meter. <laughs> well, he's moved a meter and a half. Sam, Sam. Uh, we've located uh, that Wanuna Ngala uh, lying up in the same place. There he is. So he's probably spent the whole day sleeping around here. And, but when they do lie flat, they can disappear into the grass. Yeah, he's definitely got an injury and it's a fresh one on his paw. So I'm pretty confident that he's got that from fighting with one of the other coalition members for mating rights. So there's two different Birmingham males mating with two different Inkuma lionesses at the moment. And here's the boy who's unlucky in love. Or maybe not unlucky in love, unlucky in fighting for love. He's not moving at all, and I don't think he's going to move just yet. Uh, we need to change our camera battery. So I'm going to just let Final Control know that so we can get hold of Sam and let him know that he's about to be live again. So if we disappear in the next 30 seconds or so, we apologize. It's because our battery's about to die and we need to change it. So while we do that quickly, let's jump back on board with Sam. So Brett pulls in and he's been on Tudor plans and he finds that line that he saw this morning. So he was with that line this morning and he left it somewhere there. So he was able to find it straight away. So we smelt and looked and didn't find that line, but he managed to find it. Hold on, Brett. But we are coming down towards Buffalo Dam now, and we are going to see if we can find something here. Potentially, there might be something that has come down to the watering hole this evening. So, who knows what we might find? It is starting to get a little bit more chilly as the night progresses. So, let's see, we're just there. So, we're literally down like probably 100 meters from the watering hole now. The sun is now gone and we'll see if we can spot something that might be sitting there. But otherwise we're going to drive to a position where we can do some stars this evening. Which I'm quite excited to do. Laura Park is saying, did I know it was a blue moon tonight? No, I had no idea that it was going to be a blue, blue moon tonight. Awesome. You say blue moon or full moon? Blue. What is it? Oh, 
Okay. Yes. I didn't know that. It's very cool. So we still got our hippos that are in the distance there. There they are, relaxing in this evening. I wonder how long they'll be in this watering hole for until they get out and start walking around. So they'll start grazing at some time. So we're just going, we're going to go back to the sighting with, with Brent. He's managed to find those lines again. So welcome back. As you can see, he hasn't moved too much. Still licking that injury on his paw. I'm just going to, unfortunately, we're having a bit of battery issues with our camera. It's, it's dropping. So um, we do have a few percent left, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to call Sam in here because I'm hoping this line's going to get moving shortly. Sam, uh, could you come join us on Drakensberg? I just come from Gwari Pan, head south, and you'll get our visual. So we have got some other batteries on charge back at camp. So what we'll do is we'll wait for Sam to get here, just in case he moves before then. And once he's here, we will head back to camp quickly, change the batteries, and go look for the mating pair. But look at this big boy. He is very, very pretty. You can see how dark his mane is starting to become around the edges. And it's amazing to think when I first saw these boys, they barely had a mane. Oh, yes, very tired. Got a sore foot and a big belly full of buffalo. Let me just move the vehicle back a bit. So hi, Steve in Montana. Oh, lovely part of the world. I definitely want to go fly fishing there one day, Steve. Uh, Steve saying, is a wounded lion more dangerous? If you come across a bear in the States that's injured, it's far more dangerous. Uh, well, this isn't a real a major injury. It's more of just a little nick. And these lions often have these sort of little niggly injuries. But if it had a major injury, it is definitely more dangerous. Uh, they're likely to, to forget their instinctive fear of the bipedal figure of man and try and make your dinner. So quite often when man-eating happens, it is an injured or old animal that, that becomes far more dangerous to people. But he's in very good health, apart from he's got a little cut on his foot. And you can see he's got a big fat belly full of buffalo. So he's, and full of fl and flies on the outside at least. But... Here he is. I, I wouldn't consider him more dangerous uh, than if he didn't have a limp. So one thing that I think is going to be quite wonderful this evening is I do think we're going to have a lot of lion roaring around. And hopefully we'll catch some of that on the live drive. Otherwise, listen to the Juma cam. I think we're going to hear an absolute cacophony this evening. Such a beautiful, beautiful animal. Such raw power. It's sort of that massive latent energy. And they just look so docile when they're sleeping like this. But they can literally switch in seconds uh, to this incredibly impressive, highly mobile monster. Now, the Birmingham boys are definitely not the biggest lions I've ever seen. I guess they weigh around 200 kilograms, which is about 420 pounds or so around there. And I've seen male lions, and I've actually 
darted and, and, and taken samples from a male lion that weighed 245 kilograms. And that was in northern Botswana, a big Kalahari male lion. 245 kilograms, I think it's over 500 pounds. And here comes Sam and Dave to the rescue. Oh, we need to go change some batteries that have been charging. It looks like it's them. And there we go. There we go. So we're going to move out and let Sam come in here. And we have one last look of the lion and answer one last question from Kat. Uh, <laughs> I think Sam might have realized he drove past the lion a bit earlier, uh, just judging by that look on his face. Um, so Kat's wondering if there's any healing properties in a lion survivor. Kat, not that I'm aware of. I think. Possibly, because I mean, if, if you get lion saliva on you, you're liable to get an infection from it. Maybe if you're alive, there are some healing properties, um, but I'm, I've never heard of any per se. So we're going to scoot out and let Sam and Dave come in here. And while we do that, Jen would like to know how long it would take for us to get back to camp. Uh, probably just just under 10 minutes from where we are at the moment and then we'll grab those new batteries and we'll be out but in the meantime let's go to sam uh who's behind me and let him, and enjoy carry on enjoying that birmingham boy goodbye brent see you later brent yeah so that is quite embarrassing I was looking for this, this lion everywhere earlier. I could smell him, I could pretty much taste him. And he was lying up by next to the road there. Look at, he's right there. But Brent was with the lion this morning, so that does make it a little bit easier for him to view the animal. All right, let's go and see this beautiful Birmingham boy. Hold on tight, everyone. Just got to get in here nice and comfortably. There he goes. Just lifted up his head. Let's get a visual, the best visual that we can of him. Sorry about that. Let's go a little bit. Beautiful. Look at that view. So here we are with one of the Birmingham boys. It's been quite some time. So we were smelling you and seeing your tracks everywhere this afternoon. We couldn't quite find you. But it's not easy when you're live and you're trying to find a, a lion, I must say. It's not the easiest thing. But there he is. So we might just be lucky enough to see him contact call. Or maybe even roar. Looks like he's starting to get active. that beautiful man of this Birmingham boy. So apparently there's a number of them that are actually mating at the moment. As we spoke about earlier in Torchwood, Brent was telling me that there's a mating pair on Torchwood and potentially... Oh, is he going to get up? Oh, he looks very injured. Have a look at this. So it looks like he can't even step on his foot. This is very interesting. Brent didn't tell me that he was injured. I didn't know that he was an injured Birmingham boy. So he's just got up and sat right behind us now. He's 
not far behind. I'm just gonna get into a position where he can view him again. Did you, could you see that? He goes, he's trying to get up again. Let's just see what his movements is. Let's see what it is. It's not in a good way. There he goes, he's gonna go to the toilet. This is quite fascinating. You can, if you have a look at his foot there, you can actually see he looks a little bit injured. It does look like there's a little bit of blood. So something happened, something must have happened. Maybe he was trying to get breeding rights with the other females. So we know that the other males are mating with the females. And what could have happened that he got into a fight with one of the other males to get breeding rights and he's badly injured himself. Oof. He can barely stand on his front left foot. Shame. What happened? Let's, let's just watch him as he moves off there. Reverse. It's that fascinating behavior to see how injured he is. Not behavior, rather, to see that he's not looking too well. It looks like he's just going to be following the road in that direction. It's not far away from us. Just see him at the moment. He'll come down towards the road. Looks like he's a saint walking. There he is. As you can see a little bit of the. Let's go in front. said mark I clearly see the spray there so what's going on looks like he's going to be heading in this direction have a look at the way he's walking there's a clear limb so let's follow and see in what direction he might go But I can tell you there's not going to be much running this evening from this Birmingham boy. So this might change the dynamics within the coalition quite a bit, just to see one of them quite injured like this. And you hear some crested frankens in the distance making quite a bit of noise. Let's continue. How cool is this to watch? Sorry about this, I'm going to get it out of low range. Alright, so let's go and follow this line. So he's walking right down the path in front of us. There he goes. So anything could have happened in the night, but my, my guess is that there was a little bit of a little bit of anxiety, maybe a little bit of fighting over the night between the breeding rights of those females that they're mating with. But there's a very significant limp in his stick at the moment. So we're just gonna slowly follow him. And if we're lucky, we might just get a contact call between him and the other males. What I'm quite interested in finding out is what kind of, what, what would the interaction be between the males now that maybe something happened overnight? Very, very interesting behavior. 
rather to see him injured like this. Janet would like to know, we can see quite clearly that the lion has been injured. Would we help him or wouldn't we? You're asking Janet. Janet, no, we don't help any of the animals out here. Any time we get involved with animals is when there is a disease that might spread, such as rabies. So the answer to that is no. We won't help any of these animals. It's not for, it's not for us to get involved. So he's going to hope that he can heal himself over the next couple of weeks. He is a dominant male lion in the area. But that might just, I mean, if other lions, if other kind of coalitions begin to find out that, that this male lion is in, a, in, a, in a, not a very good state, they might take opportunities to take territory. So we know that we've just lost one of the Birmingham boys, not just a couple of weeks ago. So there's only four of them left. But to see that this one now, is quite injured. It does worry me a little bit for their coalition. There is a, yeah, you can quite clearly see that. Hey, Janet, there is quite a loss in the step there. I think it could be the wrist that could be quite injured with this male line. And he's really following the path in terms of walking on the road in front of us so he's giving us such a great visual yeah let's watch him do a sample there we go he'll lift his leg that was a scent mark from a male line so not only do they roar to show dominance to a territory but they also use scent to tell other male lines that this is his area this is his territory not his but also him and his coalition so he seems quite quite relaxed as he walked down this road but that injury that injury is very present on him and i wonder which one of the birmingham boys it is so if there's anyone out there that might actually know which one it is it's a birmingham boy number two and that's the one that we've been spending some time with and i know that birmingham boy number two has quite a dark sort of main to it so that's the way in which i remember the difference between some of the birmingham boys that number two had quite quite a big man susan weil is also is commenting and saying that look he's already looking a little bit better yes susan he is he is looking a little bit better compared to when he first stood up when he first stood up and he started walking i mean you would have agree with me he, he, he walked he went straight into a limp let's go here there he goes so it looks like he's going to get down here on the middle of the road so Go around and have a look at his face. I don't even want to get into this position. Is I want to get into this position because I think he might be roaring. There we go. listen clearly he's giving off a little roar so it would be nice to see his face I'm going to reverse in a couple seconds and see if he doesn't roar now then we can get a good visual of his face let's quickly get into a position where we can see his face
fascinating. He actually got on the ground there to, to start doing those rasps that he made. It didn't sound like a roar. It was quite a very, very gentle roar that he did there. But often lions will get on the ground and roar, particularly on the ground, because that'll help with the vibration a bit more. So here he is. Let's have a look at his face. Let's see what we can see. If there's any scratches or any marks that might be on his face. I can't see any at the moment. It was just that significant limp that he had. There we go. So his face looks doesn't look like he's been in a big fight there. Just having observing his face, but we can definitely see a limp. And the limp got a little bit better towards the end. Still wasn't great. He doesn't look like he's in the best of shape. So a lot of the viewers are saying that it's blondie. I would be interested to know what is your observation of blondie? How can you tell that it is blondie? Is it because of the significant bit of blonde just on the fore of the forefront of his mane there? Could be why he's called Blondie. There is quite a significant bit of black darkness to his mane. He looks quite, he looks very tired. I mean, he has a, he walks with a bit of, Lenny would like to know, because this lion is in an uh, in injured state and has been walking around the reserve or around Juma and is not able to catch anything because there is an open vehicle here, could it or might it come and jump and get some easy prey sitting in the car next to, next to him? Lenny, I don't think so. I, I, there's, there has been cases where that has happened in the past but very very few cases one or two which was in the kruger national park so nothing i've ever heard of in the sabi sands where that has happened so lenny we are very safe here next to this beautiful looking birmingham boy i hope it's not the first time <laughs> that that ever happens it is starting to get quite a little bit dark now i'm gonna switch on my side light Ooh, sorry. So Paul is saying some of the lions, well, some of the animals in the bush are able to heal amazingly fast. And so can the lions. Yes, Paul, I agree with you. They do heal quickly. And a lot of the time you'll see them actually lick their wounds. And I think that really, really helps them in trying to heal it, get them better. Let's get it close up. It's on that left paw. So let's actually have a look at that paw and see if there's any significant damage that we can see. Where's the front left paw? So that was the, the, the paw that I was walking on. And we can quite significantly see some difficulty in his stride. I can't see much difference to it just by looking at it at the bottom. Only when we really see it start walking can we quite clearly see that there's something wrong in its walk but we were so lucky to get her just after brent found the lion and to be able to just walk behind it for some time not walk but drive behind it and see in what condition it's in hopefully he'll get up again and start walking again and if there's anyone that's just tuned in to be watched to watch there is something wrong with the step. 
there's a little bit of a limp in the left foot of this line here. And he did look like he was in quite a little bit of pain. So he should be fine. But there he goes, he's lifting his leg again, or his head. And I'm just going back in my thoughts now, just thinking about what might have happened over the night between the other male lines. But sometimes that will happen. So I'm going to put some lights on the line now. The only reason I, I switched off now is just because I noticed that he, he didn't like it. So let's just switch it on again and see how he, how he feels. There we go. He's fine. He doesn't worry too much to that light. So we can view him quite nicely now. So we're just going to get into a position where we, we can actually see his head. Oh, not his head. I'm just going to move the light so that I can... At the moment, it's pointing in the other direction. There we go. What would be quite, what would be quite interesting is if we start actually hearing the sound of the other male lines in the distance, and what potentially might happen then when he starts to hear those sounds. We know that, as I said earlier, there were two other mating pairs of lions. One in Torchwood and one was down by Gowrie Cut Line, which is not so far away from here. And we went to go look for them earlier. I went down into the block to see if I could find the mating pair. But it's very, very thick down there. So we didn't have time to go down and find the mating pair. But we know that there is a, a mating pair that's down there. that we might be able to find a little bit later. So let's, uh, let's get a little bit more lights and see. So that's where he's a little bit injured in that foot there. So now that we're looking at it more, have a look at that pad though while we're there. Much, much bigger than that of a leopard. Sometimes people can get confused between a leopard and a lion track. But just know that a male lion's track is quite a lot bigger than that of a, both a female lion and a leopard. That's the track, but I can't see any significant damage. I think that, I mean, just looking at that spot there, that there doesn't seem to be anything too bad to it there. So now it's really starting to get dark. The sun really has set. So this line should get up again, in theory, because it's they have kind of three hours in the day that they start getting up. Well, they get active at this time. So there's the other pad, the hind foot. So we saw your tracks, quite a few of them early, earlier. They were walking through here. So there he is. If we're lucky, we'll, get, we'll be able to see him get up and start roaring, start contact calling, but he does look quite thin. He looks like he hasn't eaten. From what I heard from reports, that they did actually eat a small buffalo last night. But I'm not sure if, if this lion actually managed to get something to eat. So it doesn't seem... I can't hear any sounds in the distance there of any other lines that might be contact calling. But the moon is starting to come out through the horizon there. So the moon is coming out. You probably could only just see the shine of it through the trees. It's just over there. Up there. You'll just see maybe just a little bit of them, of it coming through there in the distance. So let's have a quick little look through there. That looks very, very cool. And if we just go to the right of that, I think that's Mars that's coming up just next to the trees there over there. That star over there. Or not star, rather planet. Let's have a good look at it. So that's most definitely a planet. 
I, I don't think it's Mars, purely because it's not very red. But it could very well be one of the planets out there. Could be Venus. Oh no, it is Mars. You can quite clearly see the red on it now. So it's reflecting light back to our, to our planet. It's a really, 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 really beautiful stars out tonight. And the moon will be getting much fuller tonight. So it could be, as you said, it's the blue moon. So we'll have a good look at the moon a bit later as it comes over this thick bush here. And that's going to mark a very, very different evening here for all the animals in the bush as this bright light begins to show way for these lions as they walk on their landscapes. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful picture. It's going to be a beautiful picture when that moon does rise and we are able to see a little bit more of the moon and the lion. Betsy's asking, just because of its injury, do you think it's going to make it a lot more difficult for this lion to eat? Betsy, I do believe it's going to make life a little bit more difficult for him. Of course, I don't think he'll be able to run like he is able to. And of course, male lions, you know, they don't actually make as many kills as female lions. So it could be that he'll go and scavenge quite a lot of kills. So if he walks around and he bumps into a leopard with some food in the tree, then he'll take that, he will, he will try to get to that food. He can't climb trees much like leopards can. But they're great scavengers as well, lions are. So if he finds anything that he can opportunistically eat, he's going to, hunting is going to definitely be, definitely be a little bit harder than usual. But he's definitely looking like he's, he's been in better condition looks like he does need a good meal to eat. He's not looking very full. So just while we're sitting here as well, before, these, before the line gets up again, let's have a look at the stars one more time. I know that we wanted to talk about stars again. And if we look just above us, so we've had a look at the moon. We've had a look at moon. The moon will just be getting a little bit bigger over time but let's wait for it to, to cross over that bush, a little bit of bush there. And let's just go to Alpha Centauri, which is just over here. It's over there. So it's those two stars that are just up over there. It's not gonna be very easy to see. It's still quite bright. You can just see them there. That's Alpha and Beta Centauri. I'm not sure if you can see them right now, but that's them. And if we drew a line through that, and then we drew a line through the cross, which I'll show it to you when it comes out. It's not out at the moment, but one of those is a binary star. We were speaking about it the other night, and the other is a, not a binary star, which is it's Alpha Centauri, which is our closest star to this planet. And the, the next closest star is, is obviously the sun. So. If we wanted to go to this star, it'd take us 25,000 years, as I was explaining the other night. And it's just fascinating to learn a little bit more about how stars are and how they grow and how galaxies form and all the many, many different things. So that is Alpha and Beta Centauri. Let's come back down. You can just see the moon is beginning to rise in the distance there as this lion sleeps it's going to be such a magical scene when this moon does eventually get into view with this lion what we could actually do is we could if, if it takes too long we can move into a position where we could see the see the moon behind this lion So we still have 10 minutes, so that moon will surely rise in, in good, good, good time. So what would be interesting is to come back tomorrow morning and see in what direction has this male line gone to. 
and what might it have experienced over the night? So I'm sure he feels quite ostracized now that he, he he's not hanging out with the other Birmingham boys. He's up again. Look at that beautiful man there. So that's. He looks like he's going to go back down, but he's just lifted his head quickly. Have a look at that mane of this Birmingham boy. So it looked like he was just listening for something there. Christina just asked, what is it like to be stared at by a lion? Well, Christina, it's not so, it's not so bad. It's not as bad as you might think it is. Um, I've, been, I've been doing it for quite some time now. So they, they're very, very relaxed with us in our vehicles around them. And so I don't, feel, I don't feel nervous in the slightest, Christina. And it's all about just learning, you know. Everything with the natural world is, is learning the behavior of an animal. So the more that we learn the behavior of the lion, the more that we learn the behavior of the elephant, the more that we can live in context with them. That's, a, that's for me, is the most important part of ecology and conservation, is actually just understanding the animal and its behavior. So the more that we can understand behavior, the better we can live with them in context with them. Okay, so we're just going to move back just a little bit. Let me just get into a position where we can have a look at this moon rise. There it comes. Can you see it quite beautifully there? So we might even get good visual of the moon rising and the light on. There it is. Look at that. incredible so that's the blue moon that everyone was talking about a little bit earlier that's incredible so this moon will be beginning to rise over the plains this evening and over Juma and that will create room and it will give eyesight to the many different predators out there to be able to see everything that might be lurking around. And it's a very, very, it's a very tense time to be out in the bush, especially when the moon is this large. It just creates a lot of, just everything has to be a little bit more aware of its, what it's doing out there. I mean, if you're a predator, it just makes life a little bit easier. They're able to be seen. But also, I mean, with a male lion, male lions have very, very big manes. And so they're able to be seen a lot quicker than the females. And that's why we often find that female lions will make more kills than male lions. Because that mane sometimes gives them away to all the different herbivores out here. So there it is. That's a beautiful picture of the moon this evening. And as we sit here, we can actually see the moon rising slightly. And the male line is still very relaxed under this moon rising in the distance. It's a very, very magical thing to see. A moon rise over a male line out in the African bush. It's incredible. So we're going to just carry on looking. So let's have a look at the moon rise as it comes above the treetops here. There we go, beautiful glow. So I think it was Susan, I think, was it Susan that wanted to talk about the blue moon? 
Well, there we go. We have the moon rising underneath a magical looking male lion. I don't think he's going to be getting up anytime soon. I think he's very, very sleepy and tired. So we were just lucky to get some movement from the lion just for a couple of minutes. And then he's got back down. So isn't that awesome? So the stars are, have come out a little bit more now that it's become a little bit darker. And I'll just explain to you south very, very quickly. And if we come, come out and we go back towards the Southern Cross that we were looking at a little bit earlier, So if, we go, so if we go back to the two stars that we were looking at earlier, which were the two pointer stars, and the point there. Well, it seems that my lights just died. But there we go. We've got the two pointer stars there. So if we drew a line through those two stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri, and then we, once, when I say a line, a perpendicular line, so take those two stars, draw a line through the middle of them, straight, a straight perpendicular line through those stars. And then now that if we come out a little bit and we go up slowly, we'll come across the cross. So the cross is just above these two stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri. And there we go, that's part of the cross. So I'm not sure, can you see the cross there? Yeah, there the cross is. So you'll see that there are three stars that are quite well, you can quite clearly see them. There's one that's very, very faint on top that will complete the cross. So there's three there. There's a faint one just on top that you might not be able to see because it's still a bit dark. There we go. There's a faint one. So now draw a line through the... So draw a line from the, the left brightest star all the way down to the right brightest star. Okay. draw a line through those stars and go all the way down so as Dave comes out of this picture keep that line steady and so draw a line through that cross and then where you met the other two, two stars which was Alpha and Beta Centauri draw a line through those where that per perpendicular one was and as you get where those two lines meet from the top of the cross down to the bottom of the cross through that axis to where that perpendicular line was. Where those two points meet, then you go down and that is how you found south. So if, that, if anyone didn't understand that, I'll send a picture on my rewild page to better explain it. Look at that beautiful moon there and we come down from the moon and the magical distance and there is the male line so under the under the stars the male line sleeps and it's most likely going to be resting here for quite some time it's then going to get up probably start scent marking for a little bit longer i'll be surprised to see if he managed to get something to eat this evening but i highly highly doubt it as we can quite clearly see the injury on its foot so we're not sure what might happen, but we'll come across this area again tomorrow morning and we'll have a look and see if there's any tracks or signs of this line and see how it actually went over the night. And let's have our last look at that beautiful moon before we say goodnight to everyone after a wonderful evening sunset safari. go so now we can quite clearly see all the different things on the moon from the craters to that rabbit that you can see in the moon that darkness there and you know, often when we look at the moon we forget sometimes how how it influences our life so much from all the tidal activities that we get on our oceans 
to the actual axis of our planet. Our planet is severely influenced by the moon. So it's been a fantastic drive, everyone. I've had a, a fabulous time. Thank you very much, Dave, behind camera, who's been able to get such beautiful pictures. Rebecca and, Rebecca and Louise in Final Control, thank you very much. Thank you, all the wonderful wildlife that has showed, you, showed us everything. We'll see you tomorrow morning for a morning safari.